Well, thank you so much for tuning in today. Happy happy Tuesday and welcome back. How are you doing today? It's wonderful to be here with you. It's been a busy week. I'm sure you can agree. If you're joining us on the replay, a huge hello to you. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's wonderful to have you with us and a big welcome to my friends also at Modern Mom because you know we're streaming to you so that you can stay on top of business news as well. Let's start with the market, let you know how it closed. Today was a really interesting day in the markets, I gotta say, because the Dow closed up or ended up three points, the NASDAQ down 48 points, and the SP down less than one point. And as you know, it's key earnings week, and let's just say the players are having a very good week. Today, Alphabet, aka Google, beat forecasted earnings and revenue for the first quarter as YouTube ads grew nearly 50% year over year. That's a big deal. Google's revenue grew by 34% and reported advertising revenue in excess of, get this, $44 billion for the first quarter alone. And that is, you know, that to give you an idea, uh, is just the first quarter. And last year, same time, first quarter, they reached $33 billion. So that's a pretty significant leap. And like Tesla from yesterday, Microsoft also saw, saw a huge jump in revenue at 19% in terms of growth. In fact, Microsoft clocked in the biggest revenue growth since 2018 with Windows growth from device makers exceeding, again, their company expectations. And, you know, I don't know about you, but things seem to be getting a little bit closer to normal. Well, that's certainly what Starbucks thinks because Starbucks also has raised its 2021 forecast as their stores are getting back to pre-pandemic levels. So I don't know, have you been getting that latte? Because seems like a lot of people are, are doing so. And let me just tell you, be careful, slow down. We want to make sure that you have savings to show for it. And, you know, making coffee at home, not a bad idea. So on uh, some other good news, Pfizer may have a pill that you'll be able to take to treat COVID symptoms and still illness available by the end of the year. In fact, that's what CEO Albert Burla has shared on CNBC today. So we're excited to hear that. Well, today we're in for a treat because I am joined by my friend, the one and only Calvin Beecham. As you know, a, a superstar in the NFL. Some of you had joined us earlier on Twitter Spaces. How are you, Kelvin? What's going on, Winnie? How you doing? Well, I'm, I'm having a great Kelvin day. I, I just feel like the temperature's great. You are here. Um, where are you joining us from today, buddy? Joining you all from Chandler, Arizona. Chandler, Arizona. You know, that is a beautiful part of the country. Thank you so much for making the time. Let's just start with your bio, because so impressive, sir. Um, you are a Mexico, Texas native, BA in economics and a minor in sports management. And you didn't stop there because overachiever, master of liberal studies and organizational uh, awesomeness dynamics. Um, you've signed with the Arizona Cardinals in 2020, entering your ninth season in the NFL. So it's pretty legendary. Played previously for the Pittsburgh Steelers, the Jacksonville Jaguars, and the New York Nets. Oh, you know, maybe you've been around quite a bit. I, I know I, I know that you said this, which I loved, because on the space to say, you said you've collected a lot of friends. So in addition to his commitments with the NFL, he's known for his dedication to end hunger by working directly with advocacy groups like World Vision and supporting community food banks across the United States. And you sit on entertainment council for Feeding America. You're a professional speaker as well as an active investor. And, you know, and most importantly, I know you love your wife and your amazing three children. So thank you, my friend. Thanks I mean, so is, there anything you, you is there anything you haven't done? I mean, kind of, <laughs> just kind of impressive. I, I would say that, you know, the things that I, I, I get to spend my time doing are things that I have a passion for um, and things that, that I know are going to be done while I'm playing football. And hopefully once I, I hang it up, I'll be able to do those things long term. Well, I love that. I love that. You know, one of my dear friends is a gentleman by the name of Ronnie Lott. And um, what Ronnie no told way. me, like, yes, he's, he's a good friend of mine. We were watching Ronnie. Well, I'm sure you're going to see on a replay. Ronnie, a quick hello to you. Ronnie Lott is a good friend of mine. Let me, let me just tell you um, what you said is so true. It's like, you know, on the field and off the field and that, you know, that continue to do and serve others, I think, 
this is what I, we love to hear this. So today I'm excited because Calvin and I uh, had worked on and collaborated on a project a few weeks ago, but I'm super honored to have him on the show because we're talking about the digital divide. You know, Calvin, maybe for those who maybe aren't familiar with what the digital divide is, you want to give us a kind of a, a, a summary or a quick update on what that is? For sure. You know, when you think about the digital divide, I try to put it in very simple terms. Those who have access to internet, and those who do not. Um, and over you know, this past year, I think that everybody got a little stir crazy being at home, having kids on the internet, you know, tapping into the Wi-Fi. Uh, but there are 17 million you know, young people within America who don't have a adequate access to Wi-Fi, to hotspots, uh, to you know, what I consider to be you know, a basic um, human you know, utility here, here in America is access to internet. Um, and it's just been a, a, a passion of mine, you know, and for me, it started with, with, with science, technology, engineering and mathematics and making sure that people had access uh, to those STEM resources. But it's hard to even get to talking about those resources if you don't have access to Internet. Um, so we share, you know, both, um, you know, me and you, Winnie, you know, just a, a, a heart for people and want to see people, you know, just come out of, of the situations that they may be in to be educated in whatever facet that is. I, I love this, Calvin. It's so true. You know, sometimes we can't remember the days without internet. Many of you were born right to the internet, and you know, but there are still people not only outside the United States, but here in the United States that still struggle with that, that don't have access to internet. So let's have some fun. You know, this is some trivia, and I see many of you joining us. Joshua, I see you from YouTube. I see Vicky. I see her on Facebook with Robin joining us from, from uh, Twitter Live and many of others that are joining us. Thank you so much for being here. Let's start with a little bit of trivia. And this is, how much bandwidth do you think it takes to run Zoom? I thought that was really interesting and I wanna share this with you. Now, those of you who are watching at home, definitely jump in, see what you think. Do you think it's 100 megabytes, 283? or 0 0.038. Now, this is designed just to get you to think because obviously you need something to be able to run your Zoom, right? Actually, we need even more to run what we're doing right now, which is live streaming. Um, Kelvin, you wanna take a shot at this? I'm gonna say number one, 100. 100, okay, good, good answer. So let's see, let's see what all of you think. Now, I know this is a guess. So don't worry if you don't know the answer, because to be honest with you, I didn't know the answer. That's why I had to research this. But actually, the answer is number three. It actually takes three megabytes. So you would think that doesn't sound like that much. And Vicky had guessed 280. Yeah. So you would think it would take more to run Zoom, but surprisingly, um, they've made it so it's relatively efficient. Now, let's go with another question, because I think this is a good one. And that is, how many kids do you think are at risk of, no, of never going back to school because of the pandemic. This was really interesting to me is this too. Global. This is global. Yeah. So a lot of kids, as you know, have struggled during the pandemic because number one, they may not have the technology or devices to be able to do so. They certainly didn't have internet, but we do know that a lot of kids going into the pandemic didn't have that. But in time, some of the schools provided internet, provided laptops and whatnot. But there's still a lot of kids that we think may not be able to go back. And this is a frightening number. I know Calvin's got three little ones. I've got three little ones. So I think this really speaks to us. Um, I would love to see. I see um, actually. OK, so Joshua is saying uh, three billion kids. OK, Vicky is saying one hundred and two million. Calvin, you want to take a guess? Yes, I got three billion as well. You got three billion. Okay, that's a big number. Now it's still a really big number. All these numbers are really big. But the number that we've seen, this is kind of UNICEF shared this number. They said 24 million. 24 million kids are at risk of never going back to school. That's a big number. Imagine, like Kelvin, um, how old is your oldest? Uh six. Six. Okay, my oldest is 12. I can't imagine them never going back to school. That is a shocking number, you know. And it's a sad number, and that includes here in the U.S. Yeah, so this is exactly what Calvin was talking about, the digital divide. All right, last question, and this one we really want to hear from you, okay? How productive do you feel you've been during the pandemic? And I'd love to hear your answer. Number one, less so, I miss going into the office, working with my colleagues. More so, I'm able to juggle so much more with less commute or three other, and you know, this is like, this is one of those questions where we just want to get your feeling. Um, 
you know, Vicki, you're saying we would love to hear your thoughts. Calvin, what do you think? I mean, are you still going? Do you miss going to the office? I guess your office would be a lot of different places. <laughs> my, my office is a lot of different places. So for me, it would be number three. Number three, it'll be like a hybrid or a blur. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I will say that I'm a solid three, too, because I miss seeing my colleagues. But goodness, I mean, if, if it were a normal day today, I would have been required to be in Las Vegas for Adobe Summit. I would have needed to be at CNBC, which is in New York. I wouldn't have needed to be with my friends at LinkedIn, which is in the Santa Barbara area here in Southern California. Yeah. So I was able to move really quickly via Zoom. So I guess, you know, for me, it's a solid three, two as well. And I see cross X fighter as Joshua. He's saying that he definitely uh, enjoys not commuting. I know here in Southern California, I mean, it's getting to LA is like, it's a commute. It takes it's, it's, time. Patience, right, Kelvin? Which I know you know a lot of. Lena, it's so great to see you as well. Thank you so much for joining us. All right, let's jump into it because Mr. Kelvin has a lot to share. I'm going to tell you, you're going to love learning from him. You know, there's so many questions about the digital divide. We've talked about this a little bit. You share some of the statistics. What What do you think, Kelvin? What, what do you think is the opportunity that we have in front of us? And what are some things that you would love to see us move forward to like maybe, you know, closing in that device. So it's not quite as large. Yeah. I think, you know, the opportunity is for us to decide, you know, um, it's for us to, to roll up our sleeves and want to get to work. Um, and it's for us to find a way to mobilize, um, and, and galvanize our resources to be most efficient with our resources. Um, it's been cool to work with some, some amazing companies, you know, as an athlete, um, it's been really cool to work with, with Intuit this year. Um, you know, and I would say this year they they were able to launch, um, you know, uh, their Prosperity Hub school district program uh, into 19 schools, uh, 19 school districts in nine countries um, and be able to uh, be able to serve about one point five million kids. And that comes from being able to mobilize and realize the task at hand uh, within the digital divide, within financial literacy, uh, within readiness to be able to, to be a positive contributor uh, within the global economy and to be able to to build on those critical skills that are needed to be successful in life. But it comes from us rolling up our sleeves, being willing to let our ego down and being willing to, to collaborate. I think if, if you haven't learned anything from uh, COVID and, and, and what this pandemic has taught us is we gotta find a way to work together. Uh, I think as athletes, we understand that because we have to work as a team. We have to work in unison um, with people we like, people we don't like, people from different social economic backgrounds, people from different eth uh, ethnic backgrounds, uh, just people from different walks of life. But the only way to do that is you have to find a way to collaborate. Um, and I'm, I'm more than happy to collaborate and have, to, and have the ability to do so. Um, but we have to find ways to collaborate, let our ego down, be vulnerable, um, realize that there are people who, who need resources who, and, who need, uh, and who need help and find a way to, 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 to collaborate and galvanize. I love that. I love that. We have to find a way to collaborate. We have to let our ego down and come together. This is really powerful, Kelvin, that you share this because w w one of the things that I've enjoyed and been re very grateful of is that Intuit brought us together to work mm -hmm. on this project. And what a lot of people don't know is Intuit, which is the parent company of uh, TurboTax and Mint and QuickBooks and so much of the software that you love and enjoy, you and your family and your company probably enjoy, is that they've made a very thoughtful investment in a lot of the communities that they have offices in of really taking a proactive approach with the help of Calvin of reducing that digital divide, bringing in resources, right? Kelvin, talk to me about financial literacy. I know this is something that you're very passionate about. It's something you and I connected on very, very quickly. Um, who taught you about money? And, um, you know, how, how, how did you come about that? Because I know all of us have our own money journey story from when we were growing up. So I'm curious to learn yours. Yeah, it's it's so funny. My my mother uh, was hilarious. If we ever <laughs> wanted money as a kid, she would uh, write out a promissory note. Uh, for us. <laughs> she would make she would write out a promissory note, and you know if we we borrowed or loaned money from her, we write out a promissory note, and you have to pay her back. Uh, <laughs> just so simple, and that was kind of you know our, our first kind of exposure to to being able to to negotiate and transact with a uh, quote unquote a bank. Um, and then, you know, she would sit down and actually 
teach us how to go through a, a checkbook. You know, how do you write out a check? How do you balance your checkbook? Um, how do you realize the money that's coming in? How do you think about cash flow? How do you think about expenses? Um, so she would actually sit down and and and, and talk to us about uh, money and and the, the the environment that we had. And we didn't have a lot of money, but what we did have, uh, what we did have, she made sure that we knew where it was going. Uh, and, and, and how we're going to be able to make that money stretch. So that was kind of my first exposure. But looking back at it, um, it it's kind of hilarious that that my mother would have us, you know, sign a promissory notes. And I would think about even in college, you know, as a college athlete, you know, you know, you don't want to go out and take take a loan from a from a you know <laughs> institution. So I would just go back to mama's house and uh, go get a promissory note and, and ask for 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 a little cash and be able to pay her back when financial aid came in. So. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's funny thinking about it now. But you know, I think about financial literacy and how important it is to to our society. And again, you know, into it is who brought us together, and 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 they've been able to to talk about some of those critical skills and being able to with their you know prosperity um, uh, hub program, been able to talk to to young people um, and partner with school districts to talk about some of these very critical soft skill and some hard skill. Um, uh, you know, kind of skill, skills that are needed for, for our young people to be successful as they transition from high school to college and, and from college into the workforce. And hopefully, you know, uh, some of these kids that, that are coming through uh, the Prosperity Hub program, uh, hopefully work it into it one day. So you never know how, how the circle of life will take them. That would be really cool, right? right. I mean, that would be super cool. I gotta give it up to Mama Beecham, though. Like, how awesome is that? Because that's one of the things I talk about. As like, you gotta have a family bank situation, yeah. and to be able to go home and ask mom for a loan is just prou- That's powerful. That's like, good job, mom, for doing that. Well, but it, it's was, so it, wasn't true. A, it wasn't a lot of money. Now it's like you know a couple hundred dollars. It wasn't like I was, hey, mom, give me five thousand. Mom, give me ten thousand. I was like, hey. You know, I need two hundred dollars to hold me over. You know, hold me over for a couple weekends. You know, that's awesome, though. They both do that. I love that. And then, you know, like what you mentioned earlier, into it doing the same thing. They're actually bringing resources. They're giving money, and they're teaching kids in different communities and neighborhoods those soft skills that you talked about, as well as business skills, right? To like make that next level. And I know you got a six year old, and you got little ones too. And my, I've got little ones at home, and it's really having those conversations that we remember. Right. Instead of going to the bank, I actually uh, spoke to an athlete not long ago. He's a good friend of mine, also was in the NFL, c- coincidentally. And he says when he got his first contract, he was so proud. He headed to the bank. He tried to apply for a credit card and they gave him a credit card with a limit of like one hundred and fifty dollars. And his girlfriend like just like busted out and start laughing so hard because this was his first credit card. And yet he had an NFL contract. So. Let me ask you this, Calvin, as an athlete, right? Um, obviously, you know, income wise, you're probably not struggling as much as you were before now. How have some of the things that you learned when you were younger, how do you handle your money now? Or, um, and how do you talk to your kids about money? So two questions for you. <laughs> you know, how, how do I handle my money now? You know, me and my wife have a, a running document where we know what our expenses are uh, on a daily, you know, on a monthly basis, on a daily basis. We go through our credit credit card statements uh, rig- religiously. Um, I get updates every day on my on my, on my bank account, <laughs> checking account, and my savings account. I get I get updates from the bank every morning, so I know exactly how much money I have in my account every day. Um, but as it pertains to to kind of spending and how we even introduce it to our kids. It's a simple concept of living below our means. Um, and the thing is, is, as an athlete, it is hard um, to be able to show our kids that this is not normal. And I take my kids back to Mejia as often as I can. I take them back to Dallas and Houston, where my wife's family is, as, as often as possible to show them that what what you do and where you live at is not you know, it's not reality. So I don't want you to get caught up in, 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 in being entitled. And I, me and my wife say this all the time, we're not raising brats and I don't want mm-hmm. brats in my house. Um, <laughs> so we, we talk about this on a, on a, on a very, on a very consistent basis to, to show them how we manage money, how we talk about money, how we talk about our toys, you know, um, you know, with the, that we have in our, in our home, how we take, you know, those toys and, and, and take them over to Goodwill after after we've accumulated toys. And I'm a type of parent, I don't buy toys, but you have friends and you have friends in the league and when you have parties, 
they just accumulate more toys and it's come to the point where we don't need those toys. So how can we move those toys out? How can we give those toys to somebody else? Um, and then th talking about, you know, the financial piece behind that and what that looks like, you know, especially as they start to get older, but they're still, they're still young. So, I mean, we're using quarters and pennies and, and dimes mm -hmm. as we're having this conversation. Absolutely. I love that. And it is those quarters and pennies that are part of that very important conversation. I love that. I think it's very inspiring. You know, someone at your level, Calvin, that continues to drive that. You're absolutely right. We shouldn't be raising brats. As parents, that is our responsibility to make sure that our children re recognize and appreciate every dollar that they're around. And, you know, one thing I tell my kids, too, is let's not collect stuff. Let's collect memories and let's collect money so that we can, you know, provide for ourselves in the future. So super, super important. Also, that lesson of that um, the, the gifts that you have right now are normal and it's not something that everybody has. So super, super great. Kelvin, this is awesome. I love that. Um, let's talk about this. Um, actually, you know what? Let's have a little bit of fun. Let's segue over to our speed round, Kelvin. You thought we were getting comfortable, but it's just getting fun now. <laughs> All right, buddy, first time on Level Up, and this is how we roll. So I'm going to ask you two questions, and you get one minute to answer them. I'm sure those will be fine because you are you are a premium, premium athlete. Now let's talk about this, Calvin. What's one thing that you learned about during this pandemic that surprised you? Could be anything. You know, I learned how to play golf. Um, I'm not good at it at the moment, uh, but I've been learning how to play golf. Uh, during this pandemic and, and something that I never thought was going to be in my wheelhouse. Didn't know if my body would actually react to it too well because of all the torque, but that was something that, that I learned. And it's a new skill. Um, we, talk, we talked about skills that, that Intuit provides. Um, that has been a new skill that I've been trying to add to my repertoire. I love that. Now, those of you who are watching, if you have any golf tips or advice for Kelvin, you know where to reach him. You got to let him know because I'm sure he'd love to hear. This is awesome. I do think it just shows you, you know, we're not just one size fit. Oh, we can try different things and expand our horizons there. Next question, Kelvin. If you were to go back in time and change one thing in your life, could be anything, what would it be and why? You know, it, it's so funny. Me and my wife were having this exact conversation last night. <laughs> Uh, we were watching Dr. Strange, and you know how Dr. Strange goes back in time and changes things. It is hard for me to answer this question because it's not just one thing that I can go back and change. Um, but there are some some old flings, relationships that I just wish I just never would have gotten into, conversations I wish I never would have had that led me down roads I never wish I would have been on. <laughs> but, you know, I look at where I am today, and it's made me a better man for it. So. It's, it's, it's hard to go back and say I, I would change anything because I, I like what I've done to date. Um, and I think that it's made me a better person from it. I've learned a ton from it. But if I could, it, it, it'd be a lot of instances. It just wouldn't be just one. It'd be a lot of instances. I love that. And I, I love to hear your answer to this question because I've asked this question to, to another guest on the show. The answer is completely different. And I really, I think a lot of us can relate to that. We've had relationships in our past that really, we look back like, what were we thinking? Why did we say that? Why did we even hang out? Like, I, we had nothing. But you're right. It's made us a better person. And I don't know about you all, but I have completely valued and appreciated the one and only Calvin Beach. And to be on our show with us, share his time with us. So generous here. Calvin, for people to follow you and learn more about your journey, because your, your future is so bright, where should they go? And what would you like them to do? You know, you don't have to follow me, but if you want to go check me out, you know, you can go to, to Kelvin Beecham Jr. on Twitter, uh, Kelvin Beecham on Instagram, Kelvin Beecham on uh, LinkedIn, or you can go to my, my personal website, KelvinBeecham.com. Um, but I'm always interested in having, you know, intellectual conversations and having intellectual dialogue about an array of things. And today I had the privilege and the great honor of spending time with Winnie. Um, this afternoon. So really do appreciate you all tuning in. 
I appreciate you so much, my friend. And as a favor to me, then give him a follow. I would love for you to continue to learn from him. He's so kind of just saying that if you want to follow me, I think you should follow him. He's a great guy. Not only that is, by the way, I just got to say he's a pro in social audio. So I'm guessing you're going to get a chance to talk to him at some point as well. So those of you who tune in, you know how much I appreciate you. Thank you so much for watching, supporting our program. Take a moment to share this show. And as a reminder, you can find full ep episodes of Level Up with Winnie Sun on NASDAQ, Amazon Fire, and Roku. So be well, my friends. I can't wait to see you again tomorrow. Take care, Calvin. Thank you so much. Take care.